Welcome. Jerry Theodore is a director of the Finance, Insurance, and Trade Policy Program at the R Street Institute. Prior to joining R Street, he served as director of insurance research at Conning and in multiple roles in insurer AI. James Theodore, welcome. Um, Chairman Brown, Ranking Member Scott, members of the committee, thank you for holding today's hearing and for the invitation to testify. Today's hearing is timely. Consumers in states with ailing insurance markets struggle to secure homeowners insurance within budget. Availability and affordability concerns are particularly acute in California and Florida. Symptoms of the ailment include insurer insolvencies, insurers ceasing to do business or pausing new business, rising premiums, large natural disasters, Hillary, Idalia. First and foremost, it is a miracle that no lives were lost from Hillary or Idalia. Let us be grateful for that. California's and, in, and Florida's insurance markets are not all gloom and doom. Before we get to the good news, let's take the temperature of the broader market. Some maintain that insurance industry capital has been depleted. That's not so. In 2022, the primary insurance industry had a slight underwriting loss. For every $1 in premium that it took in, it paid out a dollar, two cents, and seven mils in losses and expenses. Investment income offset the underwriting loss, contributing to a positive 4% return. According to economist Thomas Sowell, competition does a much more effective job than government at protecting consumers. The insurance industry with over 2,600 insurers is highly competitive. Chairman Brown, Ranking Member Scott, Ohio and South Carolina are among the most competitive states for insurance, especially South Carolina. It's number four, so someone's doing something right there. I, I agree. States' residual markets are another window into insurance competitiveness. Residual markets are state-mandated insurers of last resort when insurance is unavailable in the standard market. California's and Florida's large residual markets are unhealthy symptoms. Insurance markets and loss exposures vary across states. Maine is the least catastrophe prone, whereas California is exposed to earthquake, wildfire, mudslide, atmospheric rivers, even typhoons. One would expect property insurance premiums in California to be higher than in less catastrophe prone states, but they're not. Homeowners insurance and premiums in Tennessee and South Dakota are about equivalent to California's, even though California's risk and building and repair costs are higher. California's insurance market troubles go back to Proposition 103 in 1988. Proposition 103 made California the only state to introduce public interveners who can challenge rate increase requests above 7%. This requires the regulator to address insurance rate change requests within 60 days. But the reality is that the 60-day rule must be waived before action is taken by the regulator, resulting in delays of a year or much more. This straitjacketing prevents insurers from charging risk-adjusted rates. The result is close to 20 insurers pausing new business or non-renewing policies. Proposition 103 is a form of price control. The academic literature finds that price controls do not work, and California demonstrates this. More ways the California insurance regulator handicaps insurers is by prohibiting insurers from factoring reinsurance cost and recent climate patterns into risk modeling. This is like forbidding a donut maker to change the price of its donuts, irrespective of flour and sugar costs. In contrast to California's price controls, Florida's market troubles were driven primarily by excessive litigation. As we've just heard, for years, Florida had the dubious distinction of being home to 79% of the homeowner insurance litigation in the country, despite having only 9% of the country's homeowner insurance policies. So what's the good news? In the spring, the California Assembly and Senate held productive bipartisan information hearings on climate models. And in Florida, comprehensive tort reform was signed into law. What's more, several new companies with fresh capital have announced entering Florida, one just yesterday. Going forward, California's auspicious tailwinds of change should continue, and Florida should maintain its resolve and put its history of lawsuit abuse in the rearview mirror. On that happy note, 
Thank you for holding today's hearing. Thank you for your consideration of my views. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Thunderer. It's always good to end on a happy note. Thank you for that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Theodoro, you, you said something earlier that I wanted to make sure I understood. Uh, if a company brings in a dollar in premium but pays out $1.02 in losses, that's probably a bad thing. That's right. That's right. And so the only way that you make that up is by the, the ROI on your investment between the time that you bring it in, the time that you pay it out, you have an opportunity to invest those resources if you invest them effectively in a good market, then you'll have enough to stay afloat if you don't have that good market like today's market where you have a 17% inflationary impact on companies and business, on gas, on all the supplies. It makes it more difficult to get that kind of ROI. That's right, especially following the low and long period of interest rates when investment income was lower, so the contribution from investment income was depressed and did not contribute enough to bring the combined ratio below 100%. Correct. Number two, repetitive losses. We just heard about rebuilding, rebuilding, rebuilding. Uh, National Flood Insurance Program, 1% of losses that occur are repetitive losses, but they account for about 30% of the payouts of the National Flood Insurance Program. So if you keep building in the same area where there is a disaster after disaster after disaster, the chances are pretty good you're going to pay more out. That's right. That's why there need to be incentives for, for better behavior for the National Flood Insurance Program. Now they're trying to uh, disincentivize these repetitive and severely repetitive loss properties by having a 25% increase if you have these uh, repeated events. So send the right signals and people will respond by hardening, by taking preventive measures, by increasing resiliency. Perhaps sometimes the federal government isn't really the answer to what local communities need to do in making decisions around whether or not to rebuild a property in a place where it's been, you've had multiple losses to the same property based on the same basic set of circumstances that come through a community. That's right. The uh, federal government hasn't had a good history of involvement in insurance. You mentioned the National Flood Insurance Program, which has bled billions, tens of billions of red ink. The crop insurance program also has these subsidies that don't encourage farming of the right crops and in the right areas. The insurance industry is, as you know, and the Senator Rounds, is tremendously complex. Simple in principle, but in the execution, there's administration and policy issuance distribution, actuarial, and a dozen other functions. And the federal government has no business trying to create insurance companies. It's simply not feasible. Perhaps one of the reasons why we should all thank the good Lord for the McCarran-Ferguson Act of 1945 that made our form of insurance a state-based system, based system of insurance. This structure has produced highly competitive, fair markets all across <coughs> this country and frankly, sets a global standard. Is that an accurate statement? That's right. And the efforts in the past that have followed strains in the insurance market to create a federal backstop or to provide government subsidized reinsurance have not been successful. They haven't taken off because it's simply not feasible. In 2007, a couple of years after Hurricane Katrina, KRW, Katrina Rita Wilma, Chris Dodd held a similar hearing and uh, chairman of the economic uh, CEA Ed Lazier talked about the ways in which that wouldn't be feasible. Uh, Congressman Moskowitz, uh, Charlie Crist, governor of Florida, and uh, there was a Kevin Mahoney bill. A number of bills have been introduced sort of as knee-jerk reaction. Oh, the insurance industry is having strains. Let's send the federal government in to fix it. Doesn't have a history of working then, and it won't have one now. Sounds like to me you've already answered my first question, which is about the fact that federal taxpayers subsidizing state insurance challenges is not a recipe for long-term success. That's right. Subsidies and cross-subsidies where the poor subsidize the rich are, are, are both bad. Simple, sounds like to me. Could you speak to why the insurance markets operate at a lag behind the rest of the economy? 
and why we are seeing increased prices now. One of the questions I'm really uh, trying to narrow in on is the important fact that over the last couple of years, we've seen an inflationary impact that we talked about that led to 12 rate increases. And so that new market where you have 5.25% or higher interest rates to be embedded into an insurance company's model, that costs something. That's right. And it does take a couple of years before it earns in, because as we've seen with inflation, building material costs rose by 19% in 2021, 8% in 2022. Copper prices, other prices of, of lumber and metal that's needed in rebuilding homes have gone up. But it takes time because the loss may happen towards the end of the policy period, and then for the repairs are more expensive than before. So it takes one or two years before those inflationary impacts are, are fed in. So there's three main drivers of some of the strains. Economic inflation, reinsurance cost, and natural catastrophes. I'm glad that you brought up the inflationary factor. Appreciate it, sir. Mr. Theodora, I'm curious, uh, how long have you studied or participated in the insurance market reviews? Uh, I've, I've been an analyst of the uh, property casualty insurance industry for 15 years. 12 years at Conning, an insurance research and asset management firm in Hartford, and for the last three years, leading the insurance research in the, at R Street. Prior to that, I was in the industry. I worked in the industry as an underwriter and uh, in other capacities. I'm just curious, it, 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 um, I, I was first licensed in the insurance, I was first licensed uh, to, to sell insurance as an agent uh, in South Dakota in 1978 for homeowners insurance and carried that license all the way up until 2015 when I was elected to the United States Senate. Just curious, I, during that time period, you, you learn what's in a policy and what's not in a policy. And on our, under a homeowner's policy, there was an old HO2 form and it was transferred into an HO3 form where you had named perils and then you had special all risk coverage with exceptions built in. But I was trying to think back, I don't believe I've ever seen a homeowner's policy which was available with a flood insurance as part of the original perils. Are you aware of a flood insurance or a homeowner's policy that started out under the basic forms with, with flood insurance? No, no, flood was, uh, has been excluded for several decades prior to the 1970s when, when you began. The HO3, which is the most common form, the special form, special yeah, form, yeah. is uh, excludes flood. The flood insurance program, National Flood Insurance Program, has been the, uh, the the principal provider of flood insurance. The good news is that the private market is growing. I'm going to bring some good news in here. Uh, now there's 77 private companies that are writing 31 percent of flood insurance business, compared to 12.6 percent just a few years ago. So the private market is starting to come in, especially since the new uh, rating methodology has been introduced. I, I think also there's a, right now, we have an NFIP, the, the National Flood Insurance Program, which is a backstop uh, uh, for flood insurance across the country. And I personally, I think it's very important that we get it renewed. I think it's an important aspect for a lot of areas, particularly where the risk is high. But the vast majority of Americans, they simply look at their policy and they say, I don't need flood insurance because I'm not in a flood insurance a, a flood prone or a, an area which is prone to flood, so they don't buy it, or their mortgage mortgagee does not require them to buy it. So what you end up with is, is in many cases, and a, a, the folks who would buy it are the people that think they may have a loss or are being required because the federal government believes they may be in a flood program or in a flood zone. Correct. That's right. So, and that leads to two problems. <clears throat> One, you have adverse selection which means that the policies that are written are the ones with the perceived highest risk. They're next to a river or a creek or on the coast. And you have low penetration. There's 70 million homes in the United States. Only 5 million carry flood insurance. And it's estimated that over 80% of homes in the United States are exposed to flood. As we've seen the last couple of years, we have these atmospheric rivers, these, these rainstorms that are horrific and violent that are removed from bodies of water. So the flood exposure is there. The market is underpenetrated, and there's adverse selection. You know, we, we represented dozens of insurance companies that wrote homeowners in the agencies that, that I've had an ownership interest in in South Dakota. 
I found them that they either wanted to be in the market and they wanted to be, be writing a lot of insurance coverages. They didn't want to write one or two. They wanted to write lots because they made a profit if they had a larger part of the market itself. The vast majority of insurance carriers would love to write for a particular line of co coverage if they thought they could make a profit. Fair enough? That's absolutely right. So the exodus from California is, uh, as uh, Ranking Member Scott said, law of economics. If you're losing money, there's no reason to go on doing that. So in this particular case, if we, if, if we recognize that there are certain areas around the country where carriers have simply said, look, we can't make a profit there. We're, we're on our way out. Um, mitigating circumstances, climate change is part of it. Being able to appropriately increase your rates for the risk of some of those severe weather events. If they're not able to increase rates based upon that, then they simply look at it and say, we're a for-profit organization, we can't make a profit. But there seems to be a movement out there still where people think that we should spread that out to taxpayers to pick up those losses and keep the rates low. Is that a fair assessment of what some folks think is a better alternative? Yeah, that would socialize the risk and penalize people unnecessarily and allow people that have got higher risk to go on having that higher risk. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Senator Ron. Senator Menendez of New Jersey is recognized. Uh, thank you. Mr. Theodore, what happens, though, when uh, the private market makes a uh, amount for insurance that is almost unfeasible to be able for the uh, homeowner to afford? They choose not to have um, uh, property uh, flooding insurance. And the consequences of that, when we have the storms or the wildfires or the flooding, that end, ends up the federal government comes in and helps the, the state. Isn't it better to have a system that is somewhat insured here? The uh, affordability, unaffordability issue can be dealt with with means testing. If there's real unaffordability and there is uh, home can't be moved or can't harden the home, then uh, there can be some form of means testing. The, again, the good news is that with the new rating methodology, 20% of policies have seen a decrease in the premium that they have. An, an, enormous, almost, an enormous number of people have left uh, the National Flood Insurance Program as a result of risk rating 2.0. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd seek unanimous consent to submit one opinion piece and one article related to some of the root causes of California and Florida's problems. Without objection, sir. Uh, one of those was actually co-authored by Mr. Theodore. Uh, Mr. Theodore, I want to go back to, I think, a very important uh, number that uh, Senator Scott touched on, too. said for every dollar a premium taken in, you paid out one point or a dollar and two cents. Is that correct? That's right. Okay, that's so right. for the premiums that they judged were necessary to cover their risk, they were off by two cents on the dollar that year, right? That's right. And, and they and, and fortunately, they have a hedging strategy where they have investments that hopefully have a return to, to make up those losses. So would it be fair to, for anybody to say that, that the insurers uh, – who are paying out more than they're taking in in premiums or making money hand over fist and, and greedy? No. I the, mean, based on the data? The data says they're not. The, okay. the two, 2022, there was a 4% margin, profit margin, because investment income kicked in about 600 basis yeah. points. And long term, the insurance industry has got a return of 6.5%. Mm -hmm. Companies that are publicly traded have about 14 to 15%. Yep. So the insurance industry has a much smaller margin yep. than other industries. So we're, uh, I mean, a part of what we could be doing here is considering national policy that is uh, trying to address some of the shortcomings that, in my opinion, exist as past policy that's been passed. In states like California, you mentioned Prop 103. You took a look, they're, they're addressing some of the problems in Florida through tort reform. I'm glad they, they got on board. We did that 10 years ago in North Carolina. Um, but there, there seems to be a suggestion here that we just don't have enough regulations in place at the state or federal level to fix this problem. Do you actually think there are glaring gaps in additional regulatory measures that we should take to fix this problem? No, no, no I don't. I think that the uh, push to establish some sort of or to introduce some sort of federal backstop or support, however well-intentioned, would backfire because uh, contrary to popular opinion, the reinsurance market and the primary insurance industry is not on its knees 
It's not collapsing. It's in the business of dealing with catastrophes. There are cycles in the business. Inflation and interest rates are factors beyond its control. But in the mutual insurance industry, there's companies that have been doing business for 200 years. You can't be greedy for 200 years and not lose all your business. Mm -hmm. So they're doing something right, and they've been through storms before. Do you think that there are many corporate boardrooms that have a strategy on shrinking their market size as a part of their growth strategy? Only in states where they can't make a dollar. Right. So the point is, why on earth would a major insurer exit California and Florida? Because they can't make the numbers work. They can't sustain it. Just because. Uh, so Mr. Credit. Theodore, could, could, could you explain to me why you believe a part of the actuarial process should include a credit risk rating? The uh, credit score, uh, insurance adjusted credit score, has been found to be uh, correlated with loss losses. The industry, though, I think, or from what I know and from my experience as, a, as an underwriter, doesn't uh, overprice policies because of credit scores. If it did, competitive forces would come in and right. I issue a policy. If it wasn't right. relatively correlated to the risk, it wouldn't be a factor in the actuarial process. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Lesson. Thank so you. I want to direct my questions first uh, to Mr. Theodorus. Um, th thank you for being here. Theodoru? That's right. Thank Theodore, you. Okay, sorry about that. Um, could, could you maybe just explain Prop 103, what it changed about insurance regulation in the state of California? Sure. In uh, 1988, Proposition 103, a, a ballot proposal was passed by a slim margin in California, and it gave a 20% uh, rebate to automobile insurers. It introduced the intervener process where uh, parties could... Uh, argue for rate decreases. It established a, a deemer provision, which uh, indicated that the uh, insurance department would respond within 60 days, something that hasn't happened. Uh, so those are the three main things, and prior approval of rates. Yeah. And, and, and uh, sort of, am I right that the regulatory regime that's sort of come out of Prop 103 is very backwards, folks? In other words, insurers are focused on uh, accidental loss, casualty loss, and so forth. It's happened in the past. That's what they used to set insurance rates as opposed to forward modeling for future risk. Yeah, those were two statutes that, that are introduced. One that prevents them from using the recent experience of catastrophes yep. the last six years. And there's another uh, statute that prevents the use of uh, incorporating reinsurance cost. Reinsurance is, is part of the cost of an insurance company. So yep. those are two other provisions in the California statute, which are in addition to the Prop 103. Um, uh, Great. It, th thank you. Mr. Heller, I, I want to sort of direct this question. More, uh, All right, how about today? you, Mr. Jerry? I think it's a, a, a solution to a different issue, to one of, of uh, pollution and to emissions. And... What are we going to do during the transition going from fossil fuels to renewables? Okay. If you were king for a day, Mr. Jerry, tell me what you would do to fix the problem of the cost of property and casualty insurance today. I would shine a spotlight on the areas where there's disruption and dislocation. And what does that mean? It means to... Give me three specific things you would do. Just top line to fix the, the cost problem today, have, in English. Have the California legislature to repeal Proposition 103, to have Florida continue its uh, uh, tort reforms where it has eliminated the abuses from- All right, that's two. Two, and, and the third one is to uh, educate the public about how insurance works, I think. Uh, I understand, uh, Mr. Theodoro, that uh, you indicated that the price caps uh, placed in, in California have exacerbated the problem. And, and, and clearly, uh, there's some price point at which you know, insurance companies has to raise its premiums to cover the costs of damage. And if someone caps the price um, lower than that, they will exit the market. That's your point, right? That's right. It's uh, capped at seven percent. That's another provision of Prop 103. So if you if you remove the cap, the and I'm not I understand your argument. You, you have to choose really between them exiting the market or raising the premiums, right? So that's right. The alternative is that's to right. increase premiums on on homeowners, including many low income homeowners, right? That's right. And also to encourage not building and living in the wildland urban 
uh, interface where it hasn't been mentioned, but there was a 39% increase in people building in the forests of California where they're exposed to the wildfires. Yeah. And Fort Myers in Florida has attracted, it's the sixth largest uh, place for people to move to. It's got a lot. So we should have land use policy, build right. smart. Don't right. build in areas where you're gonna get hit. Yeah. Right. I, I think the, the intention is noble, but it right. may miss the target because the largest emitters, the largest fossil fuel companies drilling, exploring, refining are outside of the ordinary property casualty insurance marketplace. They have captives. The largest oil and gas companies have got their own captives, their own inside insurance companies, which would be beyond, the, could be beyond the pale of re regulators because they're not regulated the same way. Right, just, just to be clear, we would be essentially capturing uh, the funds fees based on those who are polluted and they would help have to defray the costs. That, that's, it's a, it's a market-based solution. Thank you, Mr. Thanks, Chairman. Senator Brown. Senator Brown. So I want to get your thoughts on that statement. Um, Mr. Is it Theodoro or Theodoru? Theodoro, you said Theodoro, right. Okay, Theodoro. I'm going to do my best to get that right. Can you tell me, um, do, do you agree with that? Thank you, yes, uh, I, I do 100%. I agree that the uh, efforts to get more data on insurance companies on catastrophes and their exposure is superfluous. Data is there. There's data at NOAA and from reinsurance companies that look at natural catastrophes, looking at frequency and severity at R Street Institute because there was disagreement about whether there is increasing severity and, and frequency. We've been studying this in, in a publication that should come out in a few months. And um, also the, the FIO, the Federal Insurance Office, if we look at its remit, what is it statutorily supposed to do? To monitor the insurance industry not to direct or to manage or to insert it itself. In many ways, it's an agency without a mission. It was created as part of Dodd-Frank when people thought that the insurance industry was responsible for the global financial crisis, which it was not. So the um, federal efforts that have been introduced, however uh, well-intentioned, have not been successful. If we look at the, at the financials of the NFIP or the crop insurance program, and the way that the efforts to launch federally backed reinsurance backstops have failed. Going back to Hurricane Andrew of 1992, let's not repeat the mistakes of the past. Absolutely. And the council will focus on public-private collaborations to help build stronger, safer, more resilient communities. This is just another great example of effective state-driven solutions. And um, I'm out of time, but certainly appreciate any comments you have on the great work that Alabama is doing. It's my understanding that uh, Louisiana has copied the program, which is a good thing, but I would say that it doesn't have to be government that provides this, this funding. I'm a homeowner. I replaced the roof on my house. I called my insurance agent and I got a credit on my insurance. Doing the right behavior leads to lower losses, leads to lower premiums. Mr. Heller, be yep. very brief. 